Hello, King's Chapel. Hope you're having a good week so far. Thank you for joining us on our Wednesday Grow Night. And uh, I know many of you have been reading the Bible in 90 days with us. I know others of you are picking up this week with us in uh, in the New Testament in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but it feels good to kind of make the turn from the Old Testament into the New. And some of the things that I've been seeing um, in the book of Matthew have <laughs> really been going along with some of the things we've been seeing in Hebrews and maybe filling in some gaps. And I, and I hope that that um, is doing the same with you. Because here's what we've been seeing in, um, in Hebrews. Is that in the past, verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 1 says, this is how the letter opens. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days that we continue to live in, he's spoken to us by his son. And so the writer of Hebrews makes this... Um, makes us clear that we live under a new covenant in fulfillment of Jeremiah 31. We live in, in a new priesthood um, in fulfillment of Psalm 110. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And the writer of Hebrews says this, is that where there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So new covenant, new priesthood, new law. So the question is this, um, for, for those of us in the new covenant, what what's the law that we live under? Is there one at all? Do we have a law? Um, if it is, what is it? Um, if it is, how is it the same as the old covenant? How's it different? What's the continuity and and discontinuity? And I think Matthew, especially um, the Sermon on the Mount, helps to fill in some of these these gaps that maybe the writer of Hebrews just wasn't able to get to. Um, scholars have pointed out that it seems like Matthew is is crafting and, and, and putting together his story in such a way that we see um, the steps of the nation of Israel retraced in Jesus. So if you think about it, the nation of Israel um, fled to Egypt for their lives, uh, came out, went to a mountain, a Mount Sinai, and received the law. What do we see in Matthew? What, what did, when you read it, what did you see? Um, that Jesus is taken to Egypt um, in order to save their lives. He, Jesus comes out, he comes to a mountain, um, the Sermon on the Mount, and gives the law. He gives this, this new law of the covenant. Um, it can also be thought of as kind of his, um, his inaugural address for the kingdom. And these are... These are important things um, because what, what do we see in Hebrews? That the nation of Israel, God had given them, a, given them a good law, and what did they do? They failed. What do we see in Jesus? Jesus, where the, where the nation of Israel failed, Jesus comes and fulfills, obeys, and does the thing that God requires, and thus ushering in this new, this new covenant, this new kingdom, this new law. The, the nation failed, we, we fail, we fall into the same category, but Jesus was faithful. Jesus succeeded. So Jesus comes to Mount Sinai, um, and, and he's giving, in a sense, um, the law of the kingdom of God. And this is where we see these famous words um, in the Sermon on the Mount, um, Right before the main text that we're going to look at tonight, Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish but to fulfill. And again, this, this tracks right with what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Jesus, the old was types and shadows. Jesus is the reality. And so sometimes people misunderstand this verse and they, they say, Oh, well, you know, we still live under the law because Jesus said he didn't come to abolish. He came to fulfill. But fulfill really means here is to complete what the old the the law that the, the the nation of Israel and the people couldn't fulfill Jesus did um, fulfilling it completing it finishing it um, and thus entering into to the kingdom or ushering in the new kingdom of God um, so we're going to look through because Jesus is going to give the law of his kingdom and so let me go ahead before we unpack it all let me give it to you in a nutshell so that way as we go through it we can go a little faster and you can see it and here, here's what we're going to see in a nutshell what's what is the law that jesus is calling them to do is this he's calling them to actually live out the holy requirements that god 
God had for them. What did we see this last week? What was the problem with, with the people and their sacrifices? It wasn't that they were offering sacrifices, because that's what God wanted, but it was that they were offering sacrifices um, that were <clears throat> that were not in keeping with the lives that God wanted them to live. And so what does Jesus call us to um, in the law of Christ? He calls us not to live in a life of vain rituals. We saw this this last Sunday. Why, why did God hate their offerings? Because they were, they were just vain rituals, but they, they, would, they would turn to bloodshed and, and deceit and all of these other sins, but then they'd think because they offered the sacrifices that God was okay with it all. So no longer, so, so vain rituals were out. Um, forced obedience in, was out. Instead, what, what is Jesus doing? He's calling and requiring the people to go all the way to heart level obedience. Not vain rituals, not doing the right thing even though you don't want to, not finding the loopholes, but instead obedience, deep obedience all the way down to the heart. Because here's what we see. People think, oh, we live under, uh, you know, we don't live under the law, the, the Mosaic law. We live under grace, and so this is easy. In fact, what we see in, in the, King, or the uh, Sermon on the Mount is just the opposite. Jesus does not call us to an easier law. He doesn't call us to an easier life. He calls us to greater obedience, all the way down to heart level obedience. And this again tracks what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Um, you know, how shall we, if, if this is all the things that happen to the people who, who sinned in the wilderness and died, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation for us to whom much is given, much is required? That if, that if we're going to have the greater revelation, God's full revelations, God is going to require more of us. So let me give you one piece of good news before we look at it, because it's easy to get overwhelmed as you look through this part of the Sermon on the Mount. Is one of the keys to the new covenant and the good news, the gospel, really is good news, is not that just that there is forgiveness, but that God has sent to us his Holy Spirit to do a deep transformative work in our lives to enable us to do the things that we could never do on our own, to live in such a way that we could never live on our own, to live a life of obedience, to take, to take this obedience and move it all the way to the heart level. That's who the Holy Spirit is and what he does in us. And so we don't, we're not perfect, but we are called to live this, we are called to do it, and we can because of the Holy Spirit. So let's go through these. Let's look at just several of them. This is in Matthew chapter 5. Um, and Matthew is, or Jesus is, is, is giving the law. And you'll notice here um, that there are several things that he goes through. And he points to the law, and then he points to what his requirement is under, under the law. So chapter 5, verse number 21. So, the, well, so I guess the question is this. One of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, right? So if that's one of the Ten Commandments, what, what's the requirement of the Christian under the law of Christ, under this new covenant, what's, what's required of them when it comes to murder? Is murder okay? Uh, is, no. Uh, is murder okay or is there something else? So Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, so now Jesus is he's saying what Moses' law was, and now he's saying, here's what my law is. Here, here's the law of Christ. But I say to you that everyone, and what does he do? He goes to the heart. Everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So what happens in a lot of ways, you know, murder starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. It goes to the mind, to planning. It goes to the, to the body to act it out. And Jesus says, I'm going to come all the way here all the way to the root. Um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't hate anybody. You shouldn't have a, an unholy anger. One of the other um, of the Ten Commandments, as we know, is you shall not commit adultery. So what is, this, uh, what is the sexual ethic of the person under the law of Christ? We know what, the, what a lot of the laws were for Moses. What is it under Christ? You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. This is verse 27, 28. But I say to you that anyone that looks at a woman with lustful intent already has committed adultery with her in his heart. 
Um, unfortunately, the reality is is that is that when we struggle with with sexual sin, it starts in the heart. Um, and just because you you want to uh, be with somebody who's not your who's not your spouse. Um, but you don't do it because you might get caught or you're afraid of the repercussions or you're afraid that you'd get shot down or whatever. Um, but in your heart, you wanted to do it. That's sinful. And the law of Christ goes all the way to the heart. What about, you know, what about divorce? Uh, Moses gave, gave laws and regulations concerning divorce. What does it look like for the Christian under the law of Christ? Verse 31. Um, and it was also said, Referring to the law of Moses, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What's Jesus doing? He's raising the standard. The law of Christ calls us to more, costs us more. That for the believer, um, believers don't cause divorce um, under the old under the old system with Moses write a certificate of divorce send her on her way let her go under the new covenant what is it you stay together um, now there are a lot of other teachings in the New Testament that you know what happens if you can't what happens if one spouse wants to leave in, in, and even Jesus himself gives a, an example of or an exception um, of, of unfaithfulness but what's the point he's getting to under the old way, give her a certificate of divorce, send her on. But under the new covenant, this is not really an option except for under the most extreme circumstances. And Christians should never be the cause of divorce. Jesus calls us to more. Um, he calls them to a, a higher way. There, there, there were laws regarding oaths, what they would, what they would um, commit themselves to and what they wouldn't. Jesus calls them to a higher standard. And again, um, You've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, um, but shall perform what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, um, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is foot, it's his footstool. So, so they had, and again, this tracks with what we're seeing in Hebrews of, of the people's, um, the, the vain offerings. They had this elaborate system of oaths, and you know, what if we swear by the temple? What if we swear by the gold on the temple? What if we swear by Jerusalem? And, they had, and, and the whole point of this was to be able to give themselves an out, that, that I could swear by this or by that, and if I did this, I could get out of it. And Jesus says this, this is not the way that we live under the new covenant. We keep our word. We fulfill what we say. Um, we don't swear falsely. We, we don't, you know, we don't cross our fingers or, or you know, do all these things to give us an out. As believers in the new covenant, we are honest all the time, no matter what. What about justice in the law of Christ? There were all these laws in the Old Testament, um, like, uh, like, like legal type of things, and, and, and what happened with, with different lawsuits or different penalties. Um, verse number 38, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So Jesus calls us as believers to be willing to suffer, to be mistreated, to be wronged. And the question is this, why, why does he do Why does he call us to this? I think there are a couple. Number one, this is certainly going to be the path of Jesus. He is going to be mistreated and he's not going to lash out. He's going to accept it, um, and this be be how he gives his life for us, um, and we're called to follow in that example. But another another issue comes to this is that we we know in part we know a little bit, um, and when we begin to take vengeance into our own hands, we almost always misapply it. We either meet it out against someone who we think deserves it but doesn't. Um, maybe we are too harsh if they do deserve it, or maybe sometimes we're too lenient and God wanted to call, hold them to a higher standard. Regardless, Jesus says this, that those who are of his kingdom under his law 
don't take these matters into their own hands. Um, you know, we see in places like Romans 13 that this is the the, um, the place of of the civil authorities that, that there are, are ways to deal with this, but we don't take these things into our own hands. Um, so, so we see these examples here where Jesus is looking at the Old Testament laws and giving, um, giving what it is to be a Christian under the law of Christ. And I think he gives us enough here that when we look at the Old Testament and we look at the law in particular, that we can use the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gives us in order to apply um, or to interpret, I'll not say apply, but to interpret the law properly in light of Christ. So one of the points that I made earlier in Hebrews is that uh, we are no longer under the law of Moses. Um, the, the law of Moses is completed. He, Jesus is not a Levitical priest. He's, he's a Melchizedekian priest. Um, that the Old Testament law does not apply to us anymore, but it is still the Word of God, and it still teaches us and instructs us. So what does Jesus do? He pulls out the law, and he uses it to teach the people and to instruct them um, about the, the law of the new covenant of Christ. Um, you've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, you know, and then Jesus applies it. Murder, and he applies it. Uh, um, oaths and retaliation and all these things. So I think it gives us a lens in which we can look at the Old Testament and even though we are not under the law of Moses, read it and interpret it in light of Christ and, and receive it as the word of God to us. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, Jesus didn't, didn't give here anything as far as giving. Now, later on in, in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, he'll talk about storing up treasures um, in heaven instead of on earth. He'll talk, about, he'll talk about giving to the poor, not letting your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Uh, he'll talk about some of those things, but he doesn't like dive into the laws of, of giving. So, fill in the blank here with me. Um, you've heard that it was so, just you know, imagine you're sitting there on the countryside with Jesus. You've heard that it was said um, that you should tithe, uh, you should tithe to the Lord into his storehouse. But I say to you, how would that finish? I think it would finish something like this. Um, you've heard that it was said to tithe a, a tenth of your, of your income or increase um, into the storehouse of God. But I say to you, that all of it belongs to God. Um, that all of it is to be used to honor the Lord. Um, if, if we're looking at this, this, this goes to the, the, the heart level. And what does the heart level take us to? Uh, extreme generosity. Uh, extreme stewardship. This is money that we're managing for God. If under the old covenant, uh, the minimum was 10%, I think we're called to at least that uh, if not more, but also to understand the stewardship principle that all of it belongs to God. We can't just give a little bit, you know, 10% or whatever it is to God and then just go on our lives. And so this gives us this interpretive lens for understanding um, what, what it is in the light of the new kingdom and the new covenant in Christ. And so I hope now as you're reading this and you're seeing this great treasure that Jesus has for for us, this new covenant, this new kingdom, and this law that he has given to us, which calls us to a higher standard, but also the Holy Spirit who lives in us, who enables us to live that life that we never, ever, ever could live. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we live under this new covenant. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for transforming us from the inside out by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the law of Christ. Now I ask that you would help us to live it out all the way down deep in our hearts. The right motives, the right reasons, the right heart, the right affections, the right emotions, all of it for you. Holy Spirit, help us, enable us, transform us to live out the life this crucified life of following Jesus. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
God bless you. Thanks for being here with us. Have a great week.